At SD Bullion, our everyday low prices are already lower than the big boys' so-called flash sales. One of the fastest growing bullion companies in the country, SD Bullion, just claimed a spot on the prestigious Inc. 500. So you have to ask yourself, why haven't you joined over 30,000 new customers who've recently made the switch to SD Bullion? for the lowest gold, silver, and platinum bullion prices. To learn more, go to www.sdbullion.com and enjoy the lowest prices in the precious metals industry, period. This is the Doc and Eric Dubin with the SD Weekly Metals and Market Trap. Joining us today is a special guest, John Rubino of the Dollar Collapse. John, it's great to have you with us on the show. Hey, Doc. Great to be with you. Well, it's certainly been a volatile and interesting last 48 hours, uh, not only in the world of politics, but also in the markets. Uh, we had the markets crashing, limit down on Tuesday night, uh, what, almost 800-point drop. Um, gold spiked to just shy of 1340 Silver spiked to $19. And then in the past 24 hours, we've reversed all that. Uh, gold and silver have made round trips. Although silver's uh, recovering a little bit here as we record on Thursday afternoon, the markets have uh, made round trips. It's certainly been uh, an amazing experience in the markets these last 48 hours. Yeah, it really has. Uh, the, the reversal is kind of shock, almost as shocking as Trump getting elected in the first place is the reversal in the financial markets. Because dur during the entire campaign, whenever Donald Trump was up, stocks would go down because Wall Street was worried about what they considered to be um, an unknown factor. You know, they just didn't know what Trump was going to do. And so traders were worried about him. On the other hand, they loved Hillary. You know, she was Wall Street's candidate. So stocks would go up when she was up in the polls. And that stayed true to pattern all the way through the election. You know, stocks were tanking as it looked like Trump was going to win. And a lot of people went to bed with the uh, the Dow futures down a thousand points. <laughs> and we wake up in the morning and the market is rocking. So um, I, I'm not sure how to explain that, except to say that um, it, it's possible that a lot of conversations happened behind the scenes where Trump's people reached out to the big banks and said, listen, you know, it, it's going to be OK. We're your friend after all. We were just running against you. Um, to, to posture, you know, to define ourselves differently from Hillary. And I think that's, that's being borne out in what bank stocks are doing right now because they are soaring. Yeah. The last couple of days have been huge gains for bank stocks. And then today we hear that uh, the Trump is considering Jamie Dimon the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase as his Treasury Secretary, <laughs> and and if it's not Ooh. Diamond, it's going to be a campaign advisor who was an ex Goldman Sachs guy. In other words, awesome. we're back where we started. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so much for the outsider candidate. Yeah, and you well, you know the thing with the banks is tied into the expectation that we're going to have somewhat of a normalization of the yield curve have uh, you know, long ability for banks to actually make some money with a spread, which is the traditional ways that banking is supposed to you know, be profitable. I, I think that, well, you know, a couple weeks back, Doc, we were talking on the show about how there was a possibility that we would see the infrastructure spending plans in the tune of trillions of dollars begin to percolate into the expectations of the marketplace and shift people's uh, view as far as where the economy is going to go and all that. And, and I think, you know, the reliance on monetary policy predominantly hasn't seeped into the real economy. And now what we're seeing is probably a little bit of, you know, maybe some manipulation initially helping this, this reversal, which is something that the powers that be certainly do because they do manage the markets. That's just a foregone conclusion. I don't think we need to substantiate. But I think part of what happened – yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, I was going to say, guys, just, just stay with the banks for just a second. Um, Trump ran on a platform of breaking up the big banks and reimposing Glass-Steagall, yeah. which is a, a yeah. post-depression law that separated investment banks and commercial banks, which would have led to the breakup of all these giant – 
financial supermarkets out there. And yeah. they are not worried about that at all now. So I, I think that, um, you know, some phone calls happened and Trump's people said, you know, we weren't really going to do that after all. <laughs> and you know, you so, know what? You know, he, he doesn't even have. That's a fantastic point. And I think you're right. And he doesn't even have to make the phone calls because that just gets back to what you were alluding to before about the Treasury secretary position and all of the various other people that Trump is surrounding himself with. He's got a good neocon as a vice president. He's got, you know, all kinds of people that I certainly consider major yellow, if not outright red flags in terms of the kind of constraints that will wrap around the, the man, Trump, and negate, you know, some of what his promises were. I mean, he breaking up the big banks, holy cow, you know. Yeah, because imagine that conversation when he's sitting around the um, the table with the cabinet members and he says, okay, I want to break up the big banks. And then the, you know, the head of J.P. Morgan Chase is sitting there and he's going to say, well, here's why you can't do it. It would cause a disaster if you do this, a disaster if you do that. And he would throw technical language at Trump that Trump doesn't understand. And Trump would <laughs> probably have to back down, right? Because all his experts would be telling him, you're crazy if you do this, you'll cause a depression, blah, 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 you know, and, and so it's not going to happen. So, uh, you know, what, what is really disappointing about this, the, the good part of a Trump presidency, I think was the, uh, the excitement at having somebody at least try something new. And now it looks like we're going to get basically what Hillary would have done, at least on economics, you know, on social issues, they might differ, but that's, that's not the big sword hanging over our heads. You know, no, maybe, how we deal with our debt might, is what matters. He might push back on like, TTP and transatlantic trade agreement and, you know, things like that because he has such strong support of the base. Yeah. And but, but that elected because of, he got elected because of economics more so than anything else. And yeah, but, but got, you know, the free trade agreements were losing anyhow, you know, the most recent ones weren't even going to pass under Obama. So that, that's not a huge stretch. But that's, know, not well, the, no. Yeah, and the reason why is the precisely the same populist uprising before Trump was – I mean, if Trump was never born, it's the exact same social dynamics that have pushed Obama's hand back from his dreams of passing these beasts would have happened anyway. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it, it, it's really interesting to see how all these things are kind of the confluence of stuff that is going on. But it, it, it seems like the people are beginning to understand that – you know, infrastructure span, tax cuts. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start then with the infrastructure bill because that, that's clearly yeah. what's coming next. It's a gigantic um, road building program and bridge fixing program um, and with borrowed money, <laughs> which means we're going to pretty much do what China did post-2008-2009 uh, when, when they borrowed um, more money than any country yeah. has ever borrowed in a five-year period. And spend it on roads and bridges and, and actually entire cities. And because that kind of a process is necessarily political rather than financial, you know, it's not a market dictating this stuff. It's um, which congressman has enough pool to get a lot of money in his district, that kind of thing. Um, it's misallocated capital, most of it. So in China, you've got empty cities. You've got ghost cities. You've got airports where no planes come and go. You've got roads with no cars. And so that money was wasted, but the debt remains. So we're going to do that same thing, um, except that we're going to start from a point of record government debt, record corporate yep. debt, um, near record consumer debt, and we're going to ladle on another, what, $10 trillion or more while we're also accruing unfunded liabilities in Social Security and Medicare that are already what, four times the size of the economy. So we're, we're starting from a point where, where we're already so over indebted that we can never hope to get out from under this painlessly. And we're going to, you know, double our debt from here. This is, uh, this yeah. is something that's patently absurd and that can't possibly succeed. And that will, as, as you guys were saying before we went live, is going to cause interest rates to spike. And if interest rates spike then everybody in the world who's got variable rate debt, which is to say everybody in the world, will see their interest costs go through the roof, you know, and, and that'll just blow up the financial system. So th this is um, not a, a reason for optimism, what's happening right now. We should be terrified. 
Yeah, it's like an intermission. People, the animal spirits are running wild on Wall Street now, and we've got uh, you know, over a thousand point up on the Dow for the last couple of days in the swing, and we're going to end up crowding out the market. The the you know, Larry Summers of the world believe that worldwide big governments will be able to borrow trillions of dollars and dump that into the real economy. And that's just not going to happen without interest rates moving up considerably. If we had normalization of interest rates and we had a long bond in the you know, 5 6% area per historical norms, we'd add something like $800 billion of debt service to the United States annual budget. And we have a very, you were speaking of a variable rate financing and everyone on the hook for that. Well, you know, the United States government is partially in that position too. And it, it's, it, these, these policymakers are continuing to dr- grasp for straws, trying to fix things. They tried monetary policy at a level that the world has never seen. And it brought us down to interest rates that have never existed in humans history of negative interest rates in certain countries and, and nearly negative in the United States. And they now believe they can borrow till the, cow, till the cows come home and, and finance all of these major projects and dump all of these you know, monies into our real economy. And it is the ultimate money bubble. And it's wonderful to, to be able to bounce that, that off you and get your feedback on it because I think that not that many – you know, you, you you and James Turk wrote the money bubble, and that is essentially what we're seeing in the money bubble going insane. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And before John elaborates on that, let's also add in the fact that on the other side of the equation, we're going to be cutting taxes, uh, corporation taxes, S-corps from, I think, about 43 44% down to 15%, um, individual income taxes capped at 33%. So... Uh, I mean, not that I'm opposed to those things, but uh, you're talking about massively increasing debt while you reduce uh, the taxes coming in. See, this is a great illustration of the bankruptcy of mainstream economic ideas, because what we're doing right now would have been an excellent program for the Eisenhower administration back in the 1950s, when when we had hardly any government debt, you know, and and. Um, very little private sector debt, especially. Uh, then, you know, you ramp, they ramped up government spending in order to build the inter- interstate highway system. Okay. And that was well spent money in retrospect because it, it generated more efficiency and more cash flow than it cost. Um, and it, it didn't overburden the system because we didn't have that much debt to start with. Well, now we have more debt than any system has ever had in history. And and to leverage ourselves, you know, to go to the same well, you know, to start that same kind of a program at this point is just crazy, you know, because uh, uh, to, to um, continue with the interest rates going up theme, um, one stat that's absolutely terrifying is what would happen to Japan if their interest rates just go up to U.S. levels. In other words, if the Japanese government has to borrow money at the same rate that the U.S. Treasury pays, their interest costs would exceed the entire tax revenue of the government. So they would go bankrupt instantly if that happened. And that's just if the rates go up to today's low U.S. rates. You know, if they go up to historically normal rates of 6% on average for government borrowing, then the whole world is bankrupt. And that's and kind United, of the, the conditions that we're creating here, you know? Yeah, exactly. And if the United States market gets crowded out and we see interest rates in the U.S. Treasury market get backed up and, you know, they're already having trouble – finding buyers for our treasuries as is. We had an auction for 10-year notes or bonds, excuse me, earlier this year, earlier this week, and it um, had like 32% of the bonds left in the dealer's hands, the most that have been left in many, many years. We have a hard time actually selling our bonds on the open market. And the idea of being able to raise trillion dollar plus in the United States, 500 billion or whatever in Japan, in addition to all the stuff that they've done before. They, your, your scenario is a terrifying scenario, John. I think that we will be seeing interest rates back up. And so we are getting our our guts punched right now in the precious metals, gold going down, silver is actually going up, and it's probably responding to some extent even of just the industrial metal aspects of it. Uh, you know, this is, this is an illusion. I think we're going to have a real – my – understanding and, and, and view of the stock market 
falling 30 some odd percent at least in the next year is still something I think is going to happen, even though we're going to probably continue on with brand new highs for another month or so as people price in an expectation of great tax cuts and the vision of the real economy. <laughs> Yeah, off. this is paradise for precious metals. If um, if we really do mm -hmm. ramp up government spending and interest rates start to rise and inflation picks up, then where are you going to go <laughs> in that kind of an environment but gold and silver? Yeah. That's where you want to hide out. So this could be the catalyst for the next big run up in gold and silver. You know, eventually gold's going to five to ten thousand dollars an ounce, and silver's going well over a hundred dollars an ounce. Uh, and, and it's only a question of timing and catalysts. In other words, what sends them there, and how long does it take? This could speed up the process really dramatically. So, Doc, you seen anything like, interesting as far as retail buyers and how they're responding to the election and all the volatility? Yeah, we saw a huge influx of demand on Tuesday, and a lot of that just likely due to market volatility. Anytime we, we see big gyrations in the markets to the upside or the downside, it triggers fear, triggers greed, and we see big influxes of demand. On an anecdotal or humorous level, uh, we've been offering a, a vote Trump silver round. Uh, he will overcome. <laughs> and on, uh, yeah, on Tuesday and Wednesday, we sold as many vote Trump rounds as we did silver eagles. Oh, so that's good. <laughs> he will overcome. <laughs> well, um, and I think the mining stocks are very possibly the dot coms of the next cycle then because these things are so highly leveraged to begin with. And so thinly traded that a lot of the junior miners, you know, just in the first half of 2016, a lot of them quadrupled or quintupled on the, um, on the expectation that they weren't going bankrupt after all, you know. And that, so that's the, the first pop. And it's kind of a step function. Now, next, we'll see a spike for some other reason where they go up another two or three times and then they plateau for a while and then so on. And um, I, I don't know where it ends. I think a lot of these things are 10 baggers from here. Once this thing gets going and they're getting cheaper in the last few days. So there somewhere out there is a phenomenal entry point for the junior miners. And maybe it's today and maybe it's a few months from now. That's hard to know. But this is probably a great time to start kind of tiptoeing into that market if you're already not in there. So the important thing to understand about Trump is that he, he's basically a symptom of something much bigger, and that is the uh, the fact that the 99% has finally figured out that the system has been created by the 1% for the benefit of the 1%, and the rest of us are really um, disadvantaged by the way things are set up. You know, free trade is great um, for rich people, and it's terrible for factory workers because it means their factory gets shipped to China or Mexico and they lose their job and have to go work at McDonald's or something, you know. And immigration, open borders is great for rich people because it means there's lots of cheap nannies out there and, and factory workers who can't complain about working conditions. Uh, while for most of the rest of us, open borders means that house down the street that has 19 people living in it, you know, it's not a good deal for us. And, and so people are figuring this out, and now they're willing to vote for iconoclasts, uh, political candidates who are willing to point out that the status quo doesn't work anymore for most people and who promise to tear it out by the roots and start over. So Bernie Sanders from the left in the U.S. probably would have won the whole thing if the, if the election process was um, – um, you know, operated legally and, and competently. Um, Donald Trump, who did win, and then you got Nigel Farage in, in the UK and Beppe Grillo in Italy and um, Marine Le Pen in France. These are all the next leaders of major countries. And they all want to just rip this system apart and start over again. So we have a, a period of political turmoil in front of us that is going to resemble the French Revolution in a lot of ways. You know, it's going to be really brutal because the old system doesn't work and the guys still don't get it who are running it. You know, American elites don't understand how they lost. And well, until they figure it out and start addressing it. <laughs> and until well, they figure it out and start addressing it, then this is going to go on for a while. So I think political turmoil is a big part of the story of the next few years. Yeah. And this election for Trump was definitely... You know, one on economics in Midwest, the Farm Belt, the Rust Belt, those major trends uh, asserted themselves. And we probably did see a lot of vote rigging as well, too. But the polls were very 
these survey polls were very incorrect and also manipulative and, and designed in ways of supporting Hillary. And we had this big you know, surprise come. But yeah. Americans, by and large, are no longer buying the propaganda. And, uh, and we, can, we can see with our pocketbooks that we're spending enormously more every year on health care and all of the various things that our budgets uh, have to expand in a lot that, that what's happened in the workforce. Obama brags about having regenerated some 14 million jobs since the 2008 crash. The majority of those jobs are part-time jobs. Obamacare's uh, shift towards 30-hour or less workers. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's been an economic devastation. People since, you know, the turn of the NASDAQ bubble crashing and then the 2008 bubble crashing have reduced standards of living for average middle class Americans by more than one third. It's been it's been a really tough fifteen years and I think that that is now you know, it's it's, it's really changed the, the body politic and we're seeing this even worldwide. It's not just in America. Well we're on the topic of international politics. Uh, I want to get your guys' thoughts here before we wrap on what this ultimately will mean for uh, U.S.-Russian relations. I mean, if Hillary was elected, we are on the, the road towards uh, direct conflict, in my mind. Um, how much do you think this is going to actually influence and walk back the escalating conflict between Russia and the United States? Um, I mean, already Putin has uh, made some uh, nice remarks, uh, and he's reached out to Trump. Um, do you think... Trump's uh, difference in, in attitude and plans will be enough to uh, restore relations? I don't think we can say anything with certainty about how Trump's going to behave anywhere, anytime. <laughs> and so his foreign policy is going to be very personal because that's, the, you know, he doesn't have a um, an economic or a, a, a political philosophy as far as I've been able to tell. So he, he's going to just be himself out there. And that might be a good thing or it might be a terrible thing. There's no way to know. So that's, that's a really scary part of this whole um, it, electing an outsider thing because you, you just don't know what they're going to do because they don't have a track record. They don't have a paper trail. And hopefully – we don't get into a nuclear war with anybody major out there, but you, you just never know how it's going to go with Russia or with China and whether Trump is going to be a cool headed negotiator or a loud mouth and a bully. And we'll just have to find out, you know, and, and hope for the best. We can't know that. Uh, but there will be almost certainly political turmoil in the world in the next few years because every election anywhere in the world is going to be a lot like this one here, which means it's front page news. You know, we never paid attention to French elections in the past. We're going to do that pretty soon. You know, we're going to care or at least we're going to notice who wins these elections. And uh, the one thing about the dictatorships, you know, Russia and China won't be part of this because they don't have elections <laughs> the way we think of elections. So they're going to be um, relatively stable from the political point of view. And, you know, it's not clear how unstable democracies are going to interact with stable dictatorships out there. This is this is kind of uncharted yeah. territory. I think you're entirely right about Trump being a loose cannon when it comes to his you know, negotiating style and, and also where he's coming from when it comes to his political orientation and his goals for his base and the, uh, you know, the trade policies, pushback against China. Those kind of things could conceivably create some friction between the United States and China. However, I think that the relationship between the United States and Russia is going to massively improve, massively. What happened is a geopolitical earthquake on the order of 9-11. It is that profound in terms of what you know, Trump represents in terms of uh, you know, advisors like uh, Michael T. Flynn, former four-star four general head of uh, the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, who was, in fact, the hand that leaked the uh, State Department memo that talked that was published for, you know, the interagencies and, and for intelligence. You know, we have 617 some odd intelligence agencies in the United States. And that was produced in 2012, talking about how the you know, collapse of Iraq would lead to the formation of what would eventually become an Islamic caliphate and ISIS, and predicting that, in fact, what our policies 
we're going to do, we're going to create ISIS. All of the craziness that has been basically the United States military industrial complex's driven empire dreams of a unipolar world are going to shift around a little bit in our policies in the Middle East, and particularly with respect to Syria. It's probably going to change a lot, and uh, we're, you know, we, we, we dodged the bullet. Hillary's plan outright, if you know where to look, if you know where to you know, listen to speeches with her at you know, Council on Foreign Relations or the think tank documents that you know, are circling amongst the neocons, the advisor and all that, these, these lunatics had an outright plan to try to do regime change against Putin. They wanted to be that aggressive in terms of all of the various ways they, they gain theory and strategize and literally move the chess pieces on the, the global map, whether it's a theater of war in Syria or in Ukraine or you know, helping have terrorist acts within Russia as well. That does happen. I don't have time to explain and document what I'm speaking about, but suffice it to say, Hillary no longer having the prospects of having her merry band of neocons behind her um, and the faction of international relations policy that she represented no longer being the tip of the spear of American perspectives when it comes to uh, brand new rebooting of the Cold War. And that is what we have been witnessing in the last couple of years is an outright rebooting of the Cold War for no reason whatsoever. I mean, Russia is not a threat. They, they are a potential threat, but they are not. I mean, Russia did not invade the Ukraine. And, yeah, it's just the, the, the amount of lies that have been told to the American people are so monumental that most progressives believed that until only six months ago that Hillary Clinton was actually progressive when it comes to international relations policy. And nothing could be further from the truth. And what's insane to me is that we're, I mean, we're only eight years removed from uh, a president named George Bush, who the entire left in this country protested against uh, the Republicans as the neocon party. They were protested against wars. They protested. The same bastards behind Bush were the same bastards behind Clinton. It, they're identical. <laughs> but what's amazing to me is those same people who protested Against and you're right, they're the same people behind the same people behind Bush or the same people behind Clinton, but the entire the entire left in this country protested the wars, protested against that, and now they're having meltdowns and needing psychological assistance. That uh, the candidate that supported the same thing they were protesting against eight years ago just lost. Yeah, well, I mean, everyone thinks that Trump is you know a racist, a sexist, a, an egomaniac, and they're all correct. But quite frankly, I don't really care as much about those things as the threat and material probability of geopolitical messes spinning completely out of control based on the hubris of the neocons to the level of which we were risking, you know, a slippery slope to outright conflict with Russia. These, these maniacs wanted to go and punch Putin in the nose. And you, you don't go and punch a nuclear power in the nose. Yeah, well... This still remains to be seen, though, guys, how, what, what he's going to do, because he, he ran against the big banks and now he's hiring Wall Streeters to run his financial policy. So yeah. let's see what he does with defense secretary and national security advisor. If he, if he brings in the same old faces, then it's possible the man, we get the, the same old policy. We just T. don't Flynn. know yet. Yeah. Yeah. The man to watch is Michael T. Flynn. If he becomes defense secretary – breathe a huge sigh of relief. I mean, Michael T. Flynn has problems. I'm not singing his praises universally. The guy has, he's, I don't even want to get into it. But the bottom line is that he's not somebody who's in favor of Cold War 2.0. And that is a very, very important thing. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, see, the, the, the thing about bringing in somebody who's uh, an unknown quantity like Trump yeah. is it, it really matters yeah. who he hires. So, yeah, if, if he hires people that, that are, non-interventionists, then that's a really good sign. But, you know, if you just... Well, well Flynn is, an, an, he's an, Flynn is an, uh, an interventionist, unfortunately, but he's not, he's not a maniac globalist who believes that, you know, we should be taking efforts to try to overthrow Russia because it's just a good strategic game plan to give an experiment to. 
I mean, it's literally how crazy some of these policymakers are in our foreign policy establishment. They they just don't fully theory or theorize out the game theory consequences of what may happen. They just it's hubris. It's really just that simple. Yeah, and and so so it's really going to be really important to see who he hires, and we don't know that yet. You know, it's looking like Rudy Giuliani is the um, uh, the attorney general now. He's the leader for and that, that. That's, and that's a scary terrible. prospect. It's yeah. terrifying. And Rudy Giuliani was partly behind the cover up of 9 11. Rudy Giuliani is a foaming at the mouth neocon dirt bag. <laughs> yes. So, so he's going to be at the table, you know? And, and yep. if it's Jamie Diamond and Rudy Giuliani and Trump sitting at the table, we're not going to like the policies that emerge from that conversation, yeah. I don't think. So, so he, he really yeah. needs some, some people on the national security side to put our minds to rest here. And, and you know, so far, we don't know. <laughs> we'll just have to wait and see. Fingers crossed. It'll certainly be interesting uh, transition period over the next couple of months. And on top of all that, I'm sure uh, Obama will make a mad scramble to uh, finish his legacy as best he can though, with executive orders before uh, he uh, leaves office in January as he doesn't have uh, Hillary following up. I already read today that he was going to... Uh, um, according to Canadian sources, uh, he Obama plans to try to push through TPP on his own before he leaves office. So, hmm. thank you. Well, uh, yeah, who knows? They've been, they've been it's hard to imagine the next few months not being full of turmoil, one way or another. Yeah, and they've they've been talking about doing uh, a lame duck push for TTP for for many months now, actually, and they're going to try it. Hmm. Well, um, yeah, it's possible, but that just uh, that hurts the Democrats next time around even more, you know. And and so, hard to say. I don't know. I, the the only thing I, watch, you know, the only thing I I think when I look at the world right now is that it's time to buy gold, you know, because th this is just so uncertain, and most of the policies that we see taking shape are just flat out wrong, you know, and and so. The world is going to want, or capital at least, is going to want protection going forward. And protection is precious metals. So I'm, you know, stepping up my own buying and um, advising anybody who asks me to just go conservative from here on out, even if the market pops. Because we, we embark on a big infrastructure spending program, that policy will end really badly. So you still want to be conservative and be protected from the eventual ending of it. And precious metals is a good place to be. All right. Well, before we wrap, John, if you can let the listeners know where to find your uh, regular excellent work. Okay. I run dollarcollapse.com, which is uh, you know, a, a continuously updated site that covers most of what we talked about. And my most recent book is The Money Bubble, co-written with James Turk of Gold Money. And that's available on Amazon.com and also on dollarcollapse.com. And I'd really encourage our listeners to follow John's work if you're not familiar with it. I've followed John's work for almost two decades now. He's one of the greatest analysts out here that are putting out a good you know, a global macro context understanding that impacts the dollar and precious metals and his work's great. So dollarcollapse.com. Thanks again, John, for joining us today. So for the doc, Eric Dubin and Dollar Collapse, John Rubino, thanks for tuning into this week's SC Weekly Metals and Markets. record consumer debt and we're going to ladle on another what 10 trillion dollars or more while we're also accruing unfunded liabilities in social security and medicare that are already what four times the size of the economy so we're we're starting from a point where, where we're already so over indebted that we can never hope to get out from under this painlessly. And we're going to, you know, double our debt from here. This, is, uh, this yeah. is something that's patently absurd and that can't possibly succeed. And that will, as, as you guys were saying before we went live, is going to cause interest rates to spike. And if interest rates spike, then everybody in the world who's got variable rate debt, which is to say everybody in the world, will see their interest costs go through the roof, you know, and, and that'll just blow up the financial system. So th this is um, not 
a, a reason for optimism, what's happening right now. We should be terrified. Yeah, it's like an intermission. People, the animal spirits are running wild on Wall Street now. And then you've got uh, you know, over a thousand point up on the Dow for the last couple of days in the swing. And we're going to end up crowding out the market. The, the you know, Larry Summers of the world believe that worldwide big governments will be able to borrow trillions of dollars and dump that into the real economy. And that's just not going to happen without interest rates moving up considerably. If we had normalization of interest rates and we had a long bond in the you know, 5 6% area per historical norms, we'd add something like $800 billion of debt service to the United States annual budget. And we have a very, you were speaking of a variable rate financing and everyone on the hook for that. Well, you know, the United States government is partially in that position too. And it, it's, it, these, these policymakers are continuing to dr- grasp for straws, trying to fix things. They tried monetary policy at a level that the world has never seen. And it brought us down to interest rates that have never existed in humans' history of negative interest rates in certain countries and, and nearly negative in the United States. And they now believe they can borrow till the, cow, till the cows come home and, and finance all of these major projects and dump all of these you know, monies into our real economy. And it is the ultimate money bubble. And it's wonderful to, to be able to bounce that that off you and get your feedback on it because I think that not that many you know you, you you and James Turk wrote the money bubble and that is essentially what we're seeing is the money bubble going insane. Yeah, the last couple of days have been huge gains for bank stocks, and then today we hear that uh, the Trump is considering Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, as his Treasury Secretary, <laughs> and and if it's not mm-hmm. Dimon, it's going to be a campaign advisor who was an ex Goldman Sachs guy. In other words, awesome. we're back where we started. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so much for the outsider candidate. Yeah. And you, well, you know, the thing with the banks is tied into the expectation that we're going to have somewhat of a normalization of the yield curve, have uh, you know, long the ability for banks to actually make some money with a spread, which is the traditional ways that banking is supposed to you know, be profitable. I, I think that, well, you know, a couple of weeks back, Doc, we were talking on the show about how there was a possibility that we would see the infrastructure spending plans in the tune of trillions of dollars begin to percolate into the expectations of the marketplace and shift people's uh, view as far as where the economy is going to go and all that. And, and I think, you know, the reliance on monetary policy predominantly hasn't seeped into the real economy. And now what we're seeing is probably a little bit of, you know, maybe some manipulation initially helping this, this reversal, which is something that the powers that be certainly do because they do manage the markets. That's just a foregone conclusion. I don't think we need to substantiate. But I think part of what happened – yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, I was going to say, guys, just, just stay with the banks for just a second. Um, Trump ran on a platform of breaking up the big banks and reimposing Glass-Steagall, yeah. which is a, a yeah. post-depression law that separated investment banks and commercial banks, which would have led to the breakup of all these giant – financial supermarkets out there. And yeah. they are not worried about that at all now. So I, I think that, um, you know, some phone calls happened and Trump's people said, you know, we weren't really going to do that after all. <laughs> and you know, you so, know what? You know, he, he doesn't even have, that's a fantastic point. And I think you're right. And he doesn't even have to make the phone calls because that just gets back to what you were alluding to before about the treasury secretary position and all of the various other people that Trump is surrounding himself with. He's got a good neocon as a vice president. He's got, you know, all kinds of people that I certainly consider major yellow, if not outright red flags in terms of the kind of constraints that will wrap around the the man, Trump, and negate, you know, some of what his promises were. I mean, he breaking up the big banks, holy cow, you know. Yeah, because imagine that conversation when he's sitting around the um, the table with the cabinet members and he said, yeah, it, it absolutely is. And before John elaborates on that, let's also add in the fact that on the other side of the equation, we're going to be cutting taxes, uh, corporation taxes, S-corps from I think about 43, 44 percent down to 15 percent. 
Um, individual income taxes capped at 33 percent. So, uh, I mean, not that I'm opposed to those things, but uh, you're talking about massively increasing debt while you reduce uh, the taxes coming in. See, th this is a great illustration of the bankruptcy of mainstream economic ideas, because what we're doing right now would have been an excellent program for the Eisenhower administration back in the 1950s when when we had hardly any government debt you know and and um, very little private sector debt especially uh, then you know you ramp they ramped up government spending in order to build the inter interstate highway system okay and that was well spent money in retrospect because it, it generated more efficiency and more cash flow than it cost. Um, and it, it didn't overburden the system because we didn't have that much debt to start with. Well, now we have more debt than any system has ever had in history. And, and to leverage ourselves, you know, to go to the same well, you know, to start that same kind of a program at this point is just crazy, you know, because uh, uh, to, to um, continue with the interest rates going up theme, um, one stat that's absolutely terrifying is what would happen to Japan if their interest rates just go up to U.S. levels. In other words, if the Japanese government has to borrow money at the same rate that the U.S. Treasury pays, their interest costs would exceed the entire tax revenue of the government. So they would go bankrupt instantly if that happened. And that's just if the rates go up to today's low U.S. rates. You know, if they go up to historically normal rates of 6% on average for government borrowing, then the whole world is bankrupt. And that's and kind united. of the, the conditions that we're creating here, you know? Yeah, exactly. And if the United States market gets crowded out and we see interest rates in the U.S. Treasury market get backed up and, you know, they're already having trouble – finding buyers for our treasuries as is. We had an auction for 10-year notes or bonds, excuse me, earlier this year, earlier this week, and it um, had like 32% of the bonds left in the dealer's hands, the most that have been left in many, many years. We have a hard time actually selling our bonds on the open market. And the idea of being able to raise trillion dollar plus in the United States, 500 billion or whatever in Japan, in addition to all the stuff that they've done before, they, your, your scenario is a terrifying scenario, John. At SD Bullion, our everyday low prices are already lower than the big boys' so-called flash sales. One of the fastest growing bullion companies in the country, SD Bullion, just claimed a spot on the prestigious Inc. 500. So you have to ask yourself, why haven't you joined over 30,000 new customers who've recently made the switch to SD Bullion for the lowest gold, silver, and platinum bullion prices? To learn more, go to www.sdbullion.com and enjoy the lowest prices in the precious metals industry, period. This is the Doc and Eric Dubin with the SD Weekly Metals and Markets Wrap. Joining us today is a special guest, John Rubino of The Dollar Collapse. John, it's great to have you with us on the show. Hey, Doc. Great to be with you. Well, it's certainly been a volatile and interesting last 48 hours, uh, not only in the world of politics, but also in the markets. Uh, we had the markets crashing, limit down on Tuesday night, uh, what, almost 800-point drop. Um, gold spiked to just shy of 1340 Silver spiked to $19.00. And then in the past 24 hours, we've reversed all that. Uh, gold and silver have made round trips, although silver's uh, recovering a little bit here as we record on Thursday afternoon. The markets have uh, made round trips. It's certainly been uh, an amazing experience in the markets these last 48 hours. Yeah, it really has. Uh, the, the reversal is kind of shock, almost as shocking as Trump getting elected in the first place is the reversal in the financial markets. Because dur during the entire campaign, whenever Donald Trump was up, stocks would go down because Wall Street was worried about what they considered to be um, an unknown factor. You know, they just didn't know what Trump was going to do. And so traders were worried about him. On the other hand, they loved Hillary. You know, she was Wall Street's candidate. So stocks would go up when she was up in the polls. And that stayed true to pattern all the way through the election. You know, stocks were tanking 
as it looked like Trump was going to win. And a lot of people went to bed with the, uh, the Dow futures down a thousand points. <laughs> and we wake up in the morning and the market is rocking. So um, I, I'm not sure how to explain that, except to say that um, it, it's possible that a lot of conversations happened behind the scenes where Trump's people reached out to the big banks and said, listen, you know, it, it's going to be OK. We're your friend after all. We were just running against you. Um, to, to posture, you know, to define ourselves differently from Hillary. And I think that's, that's being borne out in what bank stocks are doing right now, because they are sore as, okay, I want to break up the big banks. And then the, you know, the head of JP Morgan Chase is sitting there and he's going to say, well, here's why you can't do it. It would cause a disaster if you do this, a disaster if you do that. And he would throw technical language at Trump that Trump doesn't understand. And Trump would <laughs> probably have to back down, right? Because all his experts would be telling him, you're crazy if you do this, you'll cause a depression, blah, 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 you know, and, and so it's not going to happen. So, uh, you know, what, what is really disappointing about this, the, the good part of a Trump presidency, I think, was the, uh, the excitement of having somebody at least try something new. And now it looks like we're going to get basically what Hillary would have done, at least on economics. You know, on social issues, they might differ. But that's, that's not the big sword hanging over our heads, you know. No, How really, we deal with he, our he debt might, is what matters. He might push back on, like, TTP and trans... Atlantic trade agreement and, you know, things like that because he has such strong support of the base. Yeah. And but but that, elected because of, he got elected because of economics more so than anything else. And Yeah, but, but got, you know, the free trade agreements were losing anyhow. You know, the most recent ones weren't even going to pass under Obama. So that that's not a huge stretch. But that's, know, not well, the re no. Yeah, and the reason why is the precisely the same populist uprising before Trump was, I mean, if Trump was never born, the exact same social dynamics that have pushed Obama's hand back from his dreams of passing these beasts would have happened anyway. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it, it, it's really interesting to see how all these things are kind of the confluence of stuff that is going on. But it, it, it seems like the people are beginning to understand that the infrastructure span, tax cuts, Okay, well, I'll, I'll start then with the infrastructure bill because that, that's clearly yeah. what's coming next. It's a gigantic um, road building program and bridge fixing program um, and with borrowed money, <laughs> which means we're going to pretty much do what China did post-2008-2009 uh, when, when they borrowed um, more money than any country yeah. has ever borrowed in a five-year period and spend it on roads and bridges and, and actually entire cities. And because that kind of a process is necessarily political rather than financial, you know, it's not a market dictating this stuff. It's um, which congressman has enough pool to get a lot of money in his district, that kind of thing. Um, it's misallocated capital, most of it. So in China, you've got empty cities. You've got ghost cities. You've got airports where no planes come and go. You've got roads with no cars. And so that money was wasted, but the debt remains. So we're going to do that same thing. Um, except that we're going to start from a point of record government debt, record corporate yeah. debt, um, near.